Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by the Tennessee Department of Tourist Development. Visit tnvacation.com to start planning your next trip to Tennessee. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Emily, before I introduce today's guest, what's something that you've discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? The suit of armor that we have in the Enlightenment Gallery was created by a man named Jeff Wasson, and he built the armor using techniques that date back centuries, with every inch of metal having been touched by a hammer during the process. That's interesting. What a lot of people don't know is that at night, a lot of times, that uh, suit of armor runs around Discovery Park, and we find it at different places throughout the museum. Exactly. We have to go put it back in its original spot. Exactly. It's crazy. I don't know how that happens. So we've got a really special guest today, somebody I've been getting to know lately. Um, We have Bart Chateau. Welcome, Bart. Thanks, Scott. I'm not that special, I don't think. I think all your guests are probably special. They're all special, but you are even <laughs> even specialer than usual um, as we celebrate the 235th birthday of our our Northwest Tennessee hero, David Crockett. Um, you've been working on a project we're going to hear all about. But first of all, I always like to find out what people's Genesis story is. So tell me a little bit about where you're from, how you got started as an actor. Well, Scott, I grew up in uh, Peoria, Illinois, which is right on the river, the Illinois River, in a town of, or should you say a city, about 100,000, 100, a little bit over 100,000, and uh, grew up there, and uh, my dad worked, he made beer, believe it or not. His name was, his name was Player Chateau. I, it's such a strange name, but my dad's name was actually a player, like a baseball player. But uh, he was a blue-collar guy. My mom and dad had raised four kids. I was the youngest of four and uh, lived in Peoria. They were all raised, my parents were born and raised in Peoria. And um, I was there from when I was born and then to kindergarten. And before I hit first grade, they snatched me out of Peoria. And they, they drove the family 45 miles west of Peoria in a small town, even smaller than Peoria, which is considered a city small town called Bradford, Illinois, of 850 people. And that's where I spent my first grade through eighth grade of my life there, literally in the middle of a cornfield with one main street. And um, <laughs> and so that was primarily my formative years of my existence was in Bradford, Illinois. Um, and then after eight years later, they snatched me back and brought me, brought me back to Peoria where I, I attended a Catholic high school called Bergen high school, which is called Notre Dame high school for four years and, uh, got my education there in Peoria. So, um, it's all my, you know, my, my grown up years are in Illinois and uh, a little bit of a city and a really, really small town. And, um, and I, I always knew I wanted to be an actor since I was two, but I grew up in Bradford, Illinois, <laughs> in which there was no theater. Theater didn't exist. There wasn't even a movie theater. So the nearest movie theater was like an hour away. So for some reason, I don't know, I, I guess I was just obsessed with um, TV and, and movies and things like that. And I just wanted to, uh, my favorite actor was Robert Redford. And uh, I wanted to be the next Robert Redford when I was a kid, if anybody remembers who that is. He's, of course, he's an incredible actor. But um, I was sort of obsessed with him and just obsessed with all sorts of things. I had so many interests, but, you know, I always knew I wanted to be an actor, and I knew I wanted to get out of that small town of 850 people eventually, which I did. And how I started to really get into theater was when they moved back to Peoria, and I started getting to theater into, um, in high school. Started studying voice there in high school and uh, from a voice teacher. And and that's how everything sort of blossomed and getting involved in community theater. And and I, I really just wanted to be a TV and film actor. You know? So how did, it, how did it manifest itself back before when you were very little? Were you one of those actor kids who was putting on plays in your basement for, you know, your family? 
Well, yeah, when I was in Peoria growing up, I was you know you, there's photos of me like you know um, I didn't go outdoors. I actually did go outdoors a little bit, but you know there's 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 fo- there's photos of me sitting in my rocking chair, going back and like about rocking back and forth, singing "Hey Hey with the Monkeys," and the monkey around. Like I always had a, a like a song in my head ever since I was a kid. That's probably because why I'm a singer. And my dad was an upright bass player as well, so he would play on the weekends and then make beer during the week. So music was always playing in my house, but it wasn't musical theater. It was like Nancy Wilson and, you know, Johnny Mathis. And so I always had a song in my head and always dressing up in my father's clothes as like characters. And on my tricycle, you could see my dad's hat, you know, and a bowler and with like a big overcoat. So I was always, I think, doing a lot of pretending and make-believe. When I was a kid. And so he played the bass, and so you were bass. exposed to uh, yeah. entertainment. Yeah, he had his own band that he played with on the weekends, and um, and like I said, there was always some sort of music going on in my house. So the moment I woke up in the morning, there was something playing on the on the record player. Now, was yeah. your mom musical as well? She wasn't, but she loved music, and she went to visit my dad whenever he played gigs on the weekend. Um, but my sister and brothers, uh, uh, my brother and two sisters are very musical as well. So, so what, what do you, what was the name of his band? Do you remember? I don't remember. Um, it was a, it, it was a, literally a jazz band that they played. They, they played jazz on the weekends. They, they gigged out in Peoria in the area and, um, they had a couple out of state gigs and, um, yeah. So that's kind of what my dad did. And my dad was, he was a singer in high school as well. He wasn't like a vocalist, but he was like in the barbershop quartet and the glee club and all that kind of stuff. So he was active in that. So that's probably so what I got. So you, you, uh, you know, were from somewhat of a rural community. And then when you moved oh, yeah. back to have some opportunities, it really did change your life to be able to have people pour into you who knew about theatering and who could guide you. Yeah, it was it was not unlike Union City as far as it being rural. I think it, I lived in a smaller town than you were in Union City. So, but when I got to to you know, it took me a year or so, Scott, to really get acclimated in high school. I was I was sort of a fish out of water. I didn't really know. I knew what I wanted to do, but I just didn't know how to get there. And then I start. I entered the speech team, and and that's kind of blossomed. I auditioned for my first play, and. And my first role was Peter Pan as Peter Pan in community theater. And then that kind of blossomed into everything. And that started created a theatrical community for me. And, um, and so that just sort of beget meeting people and taking voice lessons. And it just spurred this interest that it was already growing inside of me. So, Do you have that moment that, that those of us that are not entertainers, that we hear other entertainers say that there was a moment on stage when they heard the applause and it clicked and they knew that's what they wanted to do? Um, yeah, mine was a little bit weird because when I was in Bradford, I entered a uh, Halloween contest and <laughs> um, my mom decided she wanted to dress me up like a scarecrow. Weirdly enough, but it, it, but I was like really a scarecrow. I mean, like with a stick in my back and all that, I could barely move. So she went all out and dressing me up like a scarecrow. And so I felt like that was kind of the first time where I sort of like immersed myself into a role. So I'm like walking around. There's this, you know, I think I was maybe sixth or seventh grade dressed up like this scarecrow and people are like looking at me and I look like a real scarecrow. And, um, and I actually, when they announced the winner, um, it was in the middle of the gymnasium in this small little rural <laughs> school in Bradford. They announced my name, Scott, and I remember just running and sprinting to the middle of the gymnasium to get my. And I had a, I had an opportunity to. I can choose my gifts. I could choose the gift or whatever. Or choose the, the the prize. I should say, the first prize was like the Bradford Panther banner. And I don't know, there was like a trophy. I don't know, but I chose the banner. I don't know why I chose it. But I just remember just the the applause and sprinting to the middle of that gymnasium because I was out of the costume by then, thank (laughs) God. I couldn't sit down in the costume. I had to stand. I could barely move. So I felt like I just went through this whole like immersive role thing, which I end up doing many years later with Trans-Siberian Orchestra and making getting a lot of money for it. 
Um, but I was dressed like a homeless guy named Gerald for that f- for like 12 years. So that was kind of my first foray into like hearing the applause and and getting for the first prize and like getting the ac- the the a- accolades for this <laughs> crazy thing that I just did as being the scarecrow for an entire Eve Halloween evening. <laughs> In yeah. the fourth grade, a friend of mine named Scott Finley, we did a little play about Laurel and Hardy. And so um, I remember that so crystal clear. And he actually Facebook messaged me the other day and said, do you remember when we were Laurel and Hardy? <laughs> <laughs> Which one were you? Stan um, Laurel? You know what? I was Stan Laurel. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, and uh, yeah, no, that was uh, so <laughs> funny. And we actually went to the library and got a script out of a book and we acted it out per the script. So, of course, wow. I followed a different route uh, than you did. So um, so you're in high school and when you, it all started gelling, at what point did you decide I'm going to actually pursue this as a career? Well, um you know, when I was 16, I, I, I went to Chicago to audition for – there's these combined auditions that they have. If anybody knows in theater, they have these combined auditions all around the country in certain pockets of the United States where you can go and audition for all these theaters around the country that, that hire you for summer stock. And I was literally still in high school, and I went to this combined audition thing in Chicago. It was at some university or some school, and I was – I was auditioning in the middle of like a classroom and um, a week later I got a call and I I really bombed the audition. I was trying to do some Moliere piece or whatever. I didn't know what the heck I was doing and I didn't even sing for the audition. But I got a call a week later to come back to Chicago to audition for this film called The Breakfast Club. (laughs) And for a guy named John Hughes who was the director of The Breakfast Club, <laughs> little did I realize it would become one of the most iconic films of, of our entire, you know, uh, movie history, uh, screen history. And I was uh, auditioning for a role of the nerd. And, um, and I went in. I didn't know what I was doing, but I got the script and I, I got the scene and I went in and auditioned for John Hughes and when I was 16. And, and I knew it was something big, but I didn't think it was going to be as big as it was. Of course, it was given to Anthony Michael Hall. But at that point, when I was 16, I, 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 would always, I was already doing community theater and um, playing roles in that. I knew, you know, when I sort of brushed with sort of that kind of – it was this close to being like, you know, hitting something really, really big in my, in my career um, – even though I maybe didn't stand a chance, but still still being seen by John Hughes, I knew that it was time to really move forward with this this career and 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 buckle down and figure out I need to know what I'm doing as far as an actor is concerned. <laughs> and so so your next steps, um, did you go to a university or? What? Yeah, and I I I um I went to Western Illinois University. I don't think my grades were all that great. Um, it's where I got accepted, and but I didn't study theater for the first year. I studied broadcasting, much like you, mass communications and broadcasting, because um, I also had some interest in in being like a, a newscaster, um, or even a DJ. Um, so I had a lot of interest in that as well, and so but I wasn't very good at it. And so it just didn't work out. So I just kind of fumbled around my first year, joined a fraternity. That was a big mistake. Moved in the house, fraternity house. That was a bigger mistake and sort of flunked out of my first year. My girlfriend broke up with me. I was just like completely directionless. And so my parents were living down in Southern Illinois at the time because my father got a new job because uh, Paps closed down. Paps the brewery where he made beer in Peoria. And so um, I moved down there with them. I was kind of a transition period and worked for a while, just, you know, worked at the Muni Theater, just like selling lemonade and just didn't know Did what Did you I um, get a job as a scarecrow, possibly? <laughs> a scarecrow who sold lemonade and lemonade stands. Um, <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I kind of moved around there. And then I joined, then I went to Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville, which is right across the river from St. Louis. That's when I started to buckle down. I went there for three years. I was playing leads in plays, 
and that's where and I didn't graduate. I, I, I was, you know, I did, I did everything I could there. And I was like, you know, you guys aren't really taking yourself seriously. I think I've learned everything. Then I went across the river to St. Louis. And then that's when I got my first professional job. My first audition after I left college prematurely, I got my first professional job which lasted a year, and then I got my equity card like two, three years later. What was the, what was the first job? It was for a, a theater called uh, the Muni Student Theater Project Company, and, um, and uh, we did shows on the main stage at this place called Theater Project Company, and my first role was as Dickon in, this, in a play version of The Secret Garden. Nice. Yeah, that was the main stage show, and then we did a musical called A My Name is Alice, in which I played all these different roles. And then our job was, uh, with three or four other people, we went around um, that area, and we did plays for uh, middle school and high school kids. Um, that was our full-time job. Uh, you know, so that was my first, and that lasted a year, almost a year for that first job. Yeah. And, you know, then after that, it was in St. Louis for three years. Then I met a girl. It's always I've met a girl <laughs> um, in St. Louis who was from New York. And we were doing summer theater together. And I moved back to New York with her. And pretty much the rest is, is history from there. So, was there a moment? Was there a moment in all that where you thought, "Hey, I actually can make a living do th- doing this"? I'm, I'm I knew it. In, I knew it in St. Louis. And the moment I left college prematurely, I was a working actor. And I was literally Scott. I was twenty one. And you had you had to have had uh, many moments where you wanted to pinch yourself when you're working. You know your your Broadway career has been you know illustrious, and there's all these fun opportunities. I know there are backstage moments. And have you got any moments you can share with us where you just thought, "I can't believe I'm actually getting to do this"? Um. Yeah, I pinch myself every time I'm doing a Broadway show. I mean, you know, the last one I did was with P- the great Patty Lapone and. And war paint. If anybody knows who she is, that are theater lovers, and she is like the biggest theater diva. And I've heard horror stories about this woman. She's like the Cruella Deville of musical theater. That's what people <laughs> call her. And here I am. Um, I'm working. All of my scenes are with Patty Lapone, and I haven't met her yet. And I'm, you know, I'm I'm in eight hour rehearsals, and they're they're, I call it they Patty proofed me. Um, to make sure I was doing all the right things to not piss her off, pretty much. And um, and then I met her, and she was the sweetest person in the world. And the first time I met her was 45 minutes before I made my Broadway debut in, in War Paint with the curtain closed, and she comes out in her nightgown. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> this is going to be <laughs> – and she was just like – and she's like, come on. Hi, Bart. Um, and she said, I'm sorry. I haven't Googled you, so I don't really know what you've done. But I said, don't worry about that. Let's just get to work. Um, and she was just really lovely and kind and, and she, you know, she was – she was just the, the sweetest person in the world, and like I heard all these horror stories about how evil she was. <laughs> like she was the nicest person to me, and so. But working with her, I mean, she's the greatest, the greatest living musical theater actress there is. It's like the Meryl Streep of musical theater, and I'm having these scenes with her, and um, and I I, I I I was like every every night I had to pinch myself. I can't even believe I'm working with Patty Lapone. That was just the most amazing thing. Plus I've worked with so many other great actresses and actors and on Broadway, but that was probably the pinnacle. And that just happened like three years ago. So I'm hoping lightning strikes again. Well, and she's somebody who can afford to have her bar set as high as she wants to set it. And so she probably is frustrated with anybody who isn't trying as hard as she does. I think you're right about that. I think her standards are so high, just like a Barbara Streisand, her standards are so high that she's considered difficult or a biatch. (laughs) <laughs> and because she is, she does work so hard. And I, we, Scott, you and I talked about my, 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 my work value, my work ethic I got from my dad. You got a huge, a really strong work ethic. I work my butt off. I was getting notes from the stage manager on the day that the show closed. Still. Okay. So, I mean, I was there with him for six weeks and I was still getting notes and I was like, okay, I'm taking the notes. It's not, I do, I want to make this great. I want to make this, I want to get this right. I want to get this lighting cue right. So it doesn't bother me. Listen, I'm getting paid that much. I'm on Broadway. I'm working with Patty Lapone. I don't have that big enough ego to go, I don't need notes right now. 
So I'm just grateful to be there. I'm grateful to have a job, and I will work my butt off to do the best job I possibly can to make sure that sure the show is great. So, so, so for those listeners who don't, um, who've never been in a Broadway play, which is about 99% of the people listening <laughs> right now, um, t- talk us through a little bit of what is, what is your day like when you're in a Broadway play? Well, if you, now I've done three original Broadway musicals and, um, it's about a six month commitment right there out of the gate. That's with rehearsals and previews. So you're talking, you at least have six months of work. But, you know, I mean, the rehearsals are usually 10 to 6 in New York at a studio, okay? I uh, haven't even talked about the audition process. Uh, but but it's once you book the job, it's like a regular paying job. It's like a regular daytime job night. It's 10 to 6. Um, once you're, you know, but there's, you work eight hours a day, uh, 40 hours a week. You only have one day off. And, um, and then once... It's usually four to six weeks of rehearsals, and then you go into previews. And then once you go into previews, it could be a month of previews on Broadway, um, and there's always changes. So sometimes you're rehearsing during the day and then performing the previews at night, which can get really dicey when they throw some changes at you, and you're doing it in front of a live audience. And the previews once, are usually at a different theater. Is that right? The previews are not in a studio, but the actual theater. Okay. And so people are coming out to previews and then – but people – the reviewers aren't, aren't allowed until opening night. You're, you're really pushing, pushing through opening night. So you all those, all those rehearsals for the four weeks, five weeks and then to previews. Sometimes you preview out of town you know, as well. Um, so just like with Civil War, we rehearsed in, we rehearsed in, uh, in New York and then we previewed the show in New Haven – and uh, and New Haven, Connecticut, and then and then we had our opening night at the St. James Theater. So that's the first time that's ever happened to me. That was my first Broadway show, and um, and so it's a long process. But you know, with the original Broadway show, you're at least going to get six months of work um, when you're starting a brand new Broadway show. Now, a show that you have already existed, like like I came into Cats, like the national tour that's been running for years, you're just plugged in, man. Like I came in um, on both Cats and Les Mis. I, I joined these shows on a tour, so the fourth national and third national tours. So you're literally flown out to wherever they are. You meet the cast. You start rehearsals while the performances are going on every night. These guys are already they, – they've already been doing this for months and months or even a year. So you you meet the cast. You're rehearsing during the day at the theater. You're watching the show at night, and then after two two weeks, you're plugged in the show. You know, that's how that works. So like with Les Mis, I met the cast out in San Francisco and was out there in a month for, in, in San Francisco. Cats, I met them out in Portland or someplace like that and then started a couple weeks later in Cats. So, but with Broadway shows, it's, you know, you're in, you, you, you rehearse in the city for the four weeks and then the previews and then, but if you're being plugged into a show, like I've been a Broadway replacement, like War Paint was a Broadway replacement, the, sh- the cast has already been together for a year and a half, and I'm thrown into this cast that's already worked together. So like Bro- like Warpaint, they had done Chicago. They had been on Broadway for eight months. They all knew each other, and I come in. So I was kind of new. I was a new kid, and then that's why I think Patty embraced me so much because I was new, and I worked very, very, very hard, and she knew that I worked hard, and I was bringing co- kind of new, new ideas to the role as well, just kind of doing funny little things that nobody else had done. And um, she appreciated that. She really appreciated that. So, so being plugged into that show, I was just going to a studio for eight hours, and then I was plugged into the show like a, a week or two weeks later. And then you're staying on top of, in case this show ends, your agent's contacting you with leads on tryouts, or how, how do you prepare for the next, when the page turns? Well, um, sometimes, you know, I, I'm so ensconced in the gig, uh, in the show, um, you know, I, I very seldom I'm actually auditioning for other things at the same time. But a lot of people are trying to get the next gig because when that gig ends, they're going to be unemployed. But I've never been so lucky where I was auditioning so much that, boom, I went into the next gig and the next Broadway show and the next Broadway show. It's never really happened to me. But I have agents in Chicago and an agent in New York. 
Because um, then I know that you've also done some television. So I that have. fills in some, uh, you were on yeah. Murphy Brown. What was your favorite te- uh, television appearance? Well, the Chicago Med thing was a pretty cool thing because that was, that was in a really controversial episode called Generation Gap. I think it was mm-hmm. season two or season three. And uh, I played the father of a kid who, well, <laughs> you just have to watch it. The kid was pretty disturbed, and he does some very disturbing things. Um, yeah, uh, you're, the clip, a clip of it is on your reel, which is on your IMDb page, which I yeah. saw. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's fascinating. It's, it's, uh, the, 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 the writers were very excited about um, releasing that episode. <laughs> and I'm sitting there watching going, oh, my God, this is <laughs> really uh, controversial. But um, I was very proud of the work that I did in it and um, working with Oliver Platt. And my, my scenes were with him. And he's such a phenomenal actor. And the Murphy Brown thing was just a little brief little thing. But I've done a little bit of TV. I'd love to do more TV. So I'm actually interviewing with some agents in, in Atlanta right now because there's, there, there's a lot of shooting in Atlanta. So um, um, I would love to do more TV. I audition for the TV stuff all the time. I just auditioned for A Better Call Saul um, episode not too long ago, a Law and Order episode not too long ago. Um you know, so I'm always auditioning. I'm always putting self tapes up together for for TV film. It's just booking the thing. So hopefully, um, hopefully more work will be down the down the line for me. Well, I know for sure that you've got some David Crockett work coming up, and so <laughs> we're going to talk about that after the break. Uh, right. So when we get back, we're going to talk all about uh, Davy Crockett. Perfect. Looking for a family friendly vacation destination? The new Tennessee Vacation Planning Guide is out now and it includes tips on the best restaurants in the state, attraction information, where to stay, and more. With the mountains, the music, the rivers, the food, the attractions, and so much more, you'll find the guide is a great way to get the most of your visit to Tennessee. Visit tnvacation.com for your print or digital copy today. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review, positive reviews only, please, on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and today our guest is Bart Chateau. Bart, how many people say Bart um, Chateau, or the pronunciation is challenging on that name? Nobody ever gets it right. Um, They say Chateau. They say chateau, they say and it, but it's it or or yeah they say shadow or chateau or yeah those are the two other options. Uh, it is chateau, as in big French house. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's the pronunciation. It I put chateau. chateau in parentheses uh, wherever I have your name, so that way I'll say it right. So, <laughs> so I'm here with Bart Chateau, and we are. Um, going to talk about David Crockett. So when was the first time, for, first of all, let me say for anybody who doesn't know, Bart's been hard at work for many years on a uh, musical about David Crockett. He's a big David Crockett fan. Um, so let's back up though. Tell me, when did you first become aware of uh, Davy Crockett as an individual? Um, well, when I was a kid, I was born in 65, even though the big craze was around 1955. You talk, you, 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 you wrote about, you, uh, you think you wrote about this in your book, um, and the baby boomer sort of, you know, generation, which I'm, I'm more, um, generation X or whatever it's called. But, um, I knew about Davy Crockett through Disney and Fess Parker. I was a big, you know, um, the world of Disney every Sunday I would tune into, Disney, uh, so I, I knew about that at Fest Parker. Um, so I watched it when I was a kid, all reruns. Um, but I think I was more obsessed with Star Wars because it was ni- around nineteen when I was ten years old. That's when you usually get fascinated with those things. But um, but my interest sort of, you know, r- r- I started really as an adult, um, just more recently over the past couple years is when this script crossed my desk about Davy Crockett called The Confessions of Davy Crockett. And I start reading more about him through this writer sent me this script. His, um, the late writer Steve Warren from Austin, Texas. Now, why did he pick you to send it to? Did he – was he exposed to you somewhere? God, Scott, it's so weird. It's one of those – it's so it's one of those weird, bizarre situations where he he didn't even know who I was. I mean he Googled me and I guess – for some reason, he get, he sent it to me via email. He saw my website, 
But I don't know why he sent it to me, but for some reason, by the forces of nature, it crossed my desk. And I was like, okay. Then I called him up and said, Steve, I just got this script. I'm really interested in working with you on this. And I was looking for a vehicle, for a one-man vehicle uh, for myself. Because my, my, my dream was to do a show like Mark Twain, like Hal Holbrook's Mark Twain. And that I could take to schools like a historical figure. Because I've always been fascinated with history. In fact, one of my early um, uh, 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 accounts as a kid, as an, as an actor, was we were supposed to um, do a speech from a, a famous president. And I picked John F. Kennedy's famous speech. And I went up, I think I was in third grade or something like that. That was another theatrical moment where I went up and I did John F. Kennedy's speech and dressed like him. And I was fascinated with presidents and I was fascinated with historical figures. Um, and, and so, um, I, so, so Davey was like, was right in my wheelhouse of trying to figure out, should I do Mark Twain? And then I've also played D.H. Lawrence, who's the English writer who wrote Lady Chatterley's Lover. I've also been producing a musical about him as well that we premiered in New Orleans and we premiered in London. So I am not averse to doing historical figures. And Davy Crockett is just kind of another one that, you know, that just sort of like, oh my gosh, this is a perfect vehicle. So I started Wicker with Steve um, a couple years ago on this script. Then we workshopped it in New York. He decided, Let's, Bart, I'm going to come up to New York. We're going to do a reading of it in New York after we do some tooling with the script. I started looking at the script and said, Steve, why don't you put some more stuff in here about bullying? Because bullying is a huge, huge issue these days with kids. And, you know, Davey was bullied as a kid. And what she was so bullied that he stopped going to school and he ran away from home because he was so traumatized by it. So I said, Let, let's let's beef up this a little bit. Let's beef up this this the relationship with Andrew Jackson a little bit more. And then I was the first one to say, Steve, why don't we throw some underscoring, some music in it, bring some musicians, put them on stage and, and do some indigenous music during the time period to kind of enhance his vignettes, his stories. Because, uh, you know, to Confessions of Davy Crockett is, is kind of one, it takes place in Memphis in the 1830s, a few days before he heads out to Texas. And um, it's just Davy just entertaining the crowd and talking about his life. But I call it the story that Disney never wanted to tell you. <laughs> because it's a really dark, there's a darker side of Davy that a lot of people are not aware of. You know, about his, you know, his absence from Polly and how Polly died you know, so prematurely and, you know, and, you know, he kind of took to, took to the drink a little bit, you know, and he admits to being drinking a little too much and being ousted from Congress um, one day because he was a little too inebriated and that he's got an issue with that. And, you know, I mean, so you're we're, we're also in the script, we're also trying to trying to find more humanizing elements of Davy of not not creating as my friend David Lutkin said, a hagiography, a hagiography, which is creating a story about a historical figure and no, no warts and all. I want a warts and all about a human, a guy who goes beyond who that that myth, and that you really see a human being who's struggling, you know, who's self-aggrandizing, like you talk in your book, who likes who likes the fact that he's a little bit of a celebrity, who likes the crowd. Who likes the, the the sound of the applause, you know, and um, and so we're trying to discover that more in our show of Davy, of more of humanizing Davy a little bit more, and showing a lot of vulnerable moments that you would never, that Fess Parker may not be able to handle, <laughs> as Davy right. did. So and it's that's interesting, kind of, it's interesting yeah. that um, that the uh, Fess Parker Disney fied uh, Davy Crockett brand. Yeah. has really far overshadowed the real human being, you know, who was David Crockett. And I think your book highlights that as well as is is more of as a as a human figure and some of the, the tough decisions he had to make in life especially politically 
and that political maneuvering, and that he possibly had been used. Please read Scott's book, by the way. It's a fantastic book, and the research is there. And uh, all of the all of the, the 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 accurate materials there. Um, I'm also reading the Lion of West, the Lion of the West book as well right now. Yeah, that one's that one's really good. And thank it's you. It's very for similar it. to uh, you, the, the direction that you're going with your book. Yeah, the it's very accuracy of it. And um, and so yes, yeah, so we're that's what we're what we're trying to do is 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 really kind of peel peel away the layers of the onion of Davy. And demythologizing him in a way with with this story. Plus, you know what? And our show just having a lot of fun, just having a lot of fun. And the music will take you away. It's all bluegrass music, and you get to hear Davy sing. You know, um, and he might even play the fiddle. Not in this version, but I still <laughs> play the fiddle. So, and so you, so you recently, people may not realize that as part of your research, you came to Northwest Tennessee recently, where you yeah. know David Crockett spent the last. Uh, decade and and a half almost of his life uh, representing the people of this good region. And you and I went together to uh, the cabin there uh, in Rutherford and checked that out. And we went to Blue Bank Resort um, and and had a good good time having dinner out on Real Foot Lake. Um, and so, yeah, so, you, you know, you're coming back um, on Saturday, August 14th to do uh, selections from the play you've been working on. I know you've been working on the play in New York and, and I got the privilege of being able to hear some of it, which it's fantastic. And it makes me really excited to hear it. So what happens next with uh, getting this play in front of people? What, what are the next steps that you take? Well, um, you know, the fine people of Tennessee and I've enjoyed my visit there and meeting you, Scott, and uh, the resort was incredible, great food and great atmosphere and getting to step onto not Real Foot Lake itself. I don't walk on water, but getting to experience <laughs> Real Foot Lake of where Davy, you know, hunted all those bears in that one year. And that's where he traversed and hunted and trapped and was, you know, was an incredible experience for me. And just the fine people of Tennessee. I've been so impressed with and they're this they're just an incredible uh, a group of people and um, I look forward to coming back and you know so so as far as the show itself we we just finished the workshop with a new team that I combined together with uh, there's a musical called Woody Says out there S-E-Z that's been running for 20 years about Woody Guthrie so we combined that team with our team and like I said, it's been running for 20 years and they know what they're doing. So I'm hoping that Davy Crockett's going to be, which is called the Life and Times of Davy Crockett, is going to be the next Woody Says, in which we're going to be traveling all around and going even to Europe and going to theaters um, uh, to perform this show. And so right now what I'm in the, ha- um, in the process of doing is um, I'm working with Nick, our book, uh, the book writer who took over for Steve, who's also directing, Nick Corley. He's a New York guy, Broadway director. And um, he's, we are instilling some more stories about Davey, more humorous stories about Davey, like when Davey was in New York for the first time. And uh, he was doing his book tour and he was on that political thing. Uh, I think his book tour. And um, more stories about Davey and like being in the theater for the first time and the fire alarm going off and him like jumping out of his seat and wanting to put out the fire, not realizing that there is actually a fire company close by to put out the fire. So we got some really cool stories like fish out of water, like Mr. Smith goes to Washington stories about Davey being in New York for the first time, which I think will appeal to the New Yorkers. I don't think New York is probably, um, you know, has the, this this show doesn't have the edge that New York wants probably for the show, but we've been doing this, all the previews, all the workshops in New York, and they seem to love the story, but they want to hear more about Davey's personal life. They want to hear less about hunting and less about politics, and they're interested in more about Polly and his other wife, Elizabeth. So we're really fleshing those stories out with Davey and the two wives that he had and more of his personal life. And then I'm injecting into, from his autobiography more stories about that fish out of water story when he visits um, New York and the young boy spurring him on when he has stage fright. When he's, There's 5,000 people. I think you talk about this in your book. In the throngs, he's about right to have that speech. And he gets stage fright, and the, and the boy's just like, you know, you can do it, Davey. And so we're going to have stories like that more into our, our play as well. 
So, so um, this will a lot of people, you know, will be listening to this long after you've already been here and left. Where can anyone in the future find out more about where you are in the progress and and if it's uh, actually being on stage somewhere? Well, you can go to my website, which is www.bartchateau.com, B-A-R-T-S-H-A-T-T-O. And then we'll have, uh, we'll have updates through there. We'll probably end up creating a website for the life, the life and times of Davy Crockett. Um, um, there is a, another website called The Confessions of Davy Crockett in which we premiered that particular production, which was at the Josephine Theater in San Antonio. But it's best just to go to my website to find out more. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to target three theaters right now, Scott – which is Flat Rock Playhouse, which I think it's North Carolina or South Carolina, Arrow Rock Playhouse in, in uh, uh, Lyceum in, in, in um, Missouri, and um, and also there's also a theater in Chicago that I'm going to be targeting, and um, we're going back to hopefully the Josephine Theater in San Antonio. So I was told just to target three theaters and see if we can get on their roster also, your friend from Playhouse in the Square, Michael, Michael Detroit. Detroit. Yeah. Shout out for Michael. Him. Shout out to Michael Detroit, mm-hmm. who's a general manager for Playhouse in the Square. They have several theaters there. My goal is to do a world premiere next year of Davey. Um, and uh, I'm going to be send- sending this out to Michael probably in the next two or three weeks. So just target these three, these three, the four theaters that really, it's, it's the right kind of theater for Davey. Um, and these were suggested to me by David Lutkin, who created what he says. He said, Bart, try Flat Rock Playhouse and, and Arrow, an Arrow Rock or Lyceum Arrow Rock. And so I'm going to be targeting those theaters and see where we go from there. Um, we, have, uh, we have the script ready to go. We're going to have to make a fine t- couple fine tunings on that, adding a few more stories. But the music is all ready to go and all the musical arrangements and the charts are all ready to go for people to hear and listen to the script. And if there's any people out there that want to produce this play, you can contact me um, at my website, or you can contact me if I can give you also my email address. Yeah, please do. Which is uh, my email address is B L A R T, that's Bart with an L, business at gmail.com. B L A R T, business at gmail.com. If you guys are interested at all in producing the show um, in your next season, it's called The Life and Times of uh, Davy Crockett. Fantastic. So before we go, uh, you know, the mission of Discovery Park of America is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. So I always like to end these with finding out what inspires you. So what is what do you find to be your biggest inspiration to achieve what you have achieved? What inspires me? Um, my, I don't know. I think I inspire myself. <laughs> Um, of of just you know of having a sense of purpose and being dead on with that purpose um and and having a support team that that is there to support you with you with your dead on purpose if you don't have your support team like family and community um then it's it's really hard to stay on purpose but um you know, I, I, I feel like I've been on purpose since I was a, a young boy considering, you know, I, I haven't gone out to achieve fame or, you know, I mean, of course, we'd all love to be a celebrity for a day and see how that works out. <laughs> um, but I, I just want to do great. I want to do great work and I want to do art, great artistic work and I want to do truthful work. And that inspires me to get up every day and be on purpose with creating great stuff, great work. And also bringing people together that are some of the best, brightest, and smartest artists and bringing them together to create something really cool to inspire audiences. So not only am I inspired by my purpose, um, but I'm inspired by my team, Team Bart, that, that you know tells me, Bart, you can keep, keep doing this, keep going, and inspired by my community around me um, that, uh, that fortifies that. So fantastic. And I'm so excited to see some scenes from Davy Crockett uh, next week. And thank you for being on our podcast today. Thanks, Scott. This has been an honor and a privilege and uh, fine people of Tennessee. Uh, we love you all. So thank you. 
And thanks to all of you listeners out there who joined Bart, Emily, and me today at Discovery Park of America. As I said, our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com.